There was a moment in my life where the only thing I would listen to was a Disney Channel band. <laughs> Hi, I'm Michelle, and I'm speaking to Barty Strange for Enemies in Conversation series. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Um, I'm doing great after that amazing show you just put on. Thanks. Yeah, how did it feel? It felt good. First time in London. First time performing in London. Yeah, first time playing in London. Not bad. Not bad? Not bad. It's really Not, good. And you're playing Dingles later, right? Yeah, everyone's using two names. They're mm -hmm. all like, you're playing at Powerhouse, and then someone beside them goes, Dingwalls. Yeah. Yeah. Actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so how, so you've been to London before. Yeah. You actually have quite a, a history with England and we'll come to that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, but how does it feel to be finally sort of being a touring musician and performing musician coming to these sort of seminal historic, you know, London venues and having the opportunity to play here and uh, really kind of nestling into the culture? I mean, it's a dream come true. I've always wanted to come back and play like this. Mm. Um, when I left the UK, I, I, I didn't think I would get to really come back. You know, it was, I was in a military family and we moved a lot. Um, also, place is so important. We played a show in Manchester the other day and there was a guy that walked into the club and he was pointing to his shirt. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it and it said Ipswich Town <laughs> on it. And he was like looking at me, pointing at the shirt. And I was like, this guy like totally claims me like we're like neighbors, mm -hmm. you know, and like I always kind of thought Ipswich was just like in my rear view. But mm -hmm. it was so cool that people here still have like some connection to me. And yeah. It's nice to be back because I definitely feel a connection mm -hmm. here as well. So it's been really nice. So yeah, how did you come about um, being in Ipswich or your parents being in Ipswich? Yeah. So my my dad, um, my parents are from the South in mm -hmm. America, not South America, but mm -hmm. the American South. Mm -hmm. um, they're from North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. Um, my dad got a job um, working in Ipswich. He was in the military, stationed at Bent Waters, mm -hmm. um, working on planes. And, you know, he moved there. And my mom, she's a singer. She was singing at University of Nottingham and a few other places and kind of trying to figure out if she wanted to start teaching. And mm -hmm. so they decided to live there together. And that's where I was born. Um, but, you know, I grew up mostly on a base um, mm -hmm. in Ipswich. And I do remember... Like my one Ipswichy thing, um, my mom, she bought me, this tells you a lot about my mom. She knew that the sweaters were really warm, like all the lamb wool, like super thick, dense sweaters. Mm -hmm. And I was growing fast and I have a little brother. And so she bought me the same sweater in like five sizes. Like, the, <laughs> and now like, I, and I, I have the biggest one now that I can fit, but it's pretty wild. Like mm -hmm. she was just like, we may never have a sweater this nice again. Right. So let's get five. <laughs> so aside, from, aside yeah. from the military base, your memory of it yeah. switch is sweaters and amazing. Yeah, you know, I think um, we're explaining it well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely, definitely. <laughs> um, life on a military base, what's that like? Do you still, so I, I remember reading loads of stories about English people or, or British people on American military bases and they get things like, you know, the amazing British cuisine like baked beans and... Amazing. Uh, yeah, so do you get that sort of stuff from your American military bases and like yeah. I don't know like thick bacon and I remember like everyone went to my school like we went to mm -hmm. like little schools that were on base too and it was like super diverse a lot of British people but a lot of Americans mm -hmm. a lot of Bengali people a lot of Indian folks like there was kind of this weird like little mosaic melting mm -hmm. pot kind of vibe on the base um, which I kind of thought was just the world then I remember moving to the states and being like oh whoa like yeah I've been in a weird like makeup world you know, yeah. um, but like a lot of good times from growing up there. I was kind of raised by a lot of people in my little community. My dad would travel a lot. My mom would travel a lot. So all ladies at church and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is it, am I right in thinking that your mom was a specifically an opera singer? Or, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And do you take any kind of influence from, from the way that she sings the way that, that you do? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess like singing isn't scary to me. Mm -hmm. Like it's, I, I grew up with it and my mom, I watched her do it all over the world. And it's weird to say I was trained by my mom because it was just like, she was my mom. Yeah. So, but yeah, she kind of taught us how to use our voices. And instead. was music always a huge part of your family? Um, just always kind of playing and... Yeah. I mean, my mom always had students in and out of the house, mm -hmm. you know, from the morning till the evening, there was always singing or someone playing piano or someone shedding something on bass or learning something. And I like 
before I started making music, I just loved music. And my dad had records and tape players and stuff when he would go to like Japan and bring back like huge, like, like reel to reels and stuff. And I would just like press all the buttons and listen to everything in slow motion and, yeah. you know, the whole thing. Did you ever feel a period of, um, I guess, rebellion from your parents' tastes? So my dad kind of <laughs> fucked me up. He was like, I, I tried to rebel, right? Mm -hmm. I grew up listening to mostly like Christian music. My mom was like, so scared of us becoming like hood booger like kids mm -hmm. you know so she was like you know like no secular music no radio it was like gospel jazz classical music period um and then i started meeting kids that like had lives and radios and big brothers and sisters who were showing them music so they would show me stuff and so i started sneaking stuff into my house listening to music on my little like walkman and stuff i had a what's it called a talk boy do you remember those little toys? No. <laughs> was, it, was it with a little tape or like? Yeah, with okay. a talk boy. It was from um, Home Alone. Okay. Uh, Macaulay Culkin used one to record the bad guys in his house. Okay. And they made a toy from it, which I loved. I used to record stuff with it. But you could get little tapes and put it in it, and there was a headphone jack, and I would listen to stuff. And I remember one time, I was showing my dad like a Led Zeppelin song, because it was like seventh grade. Everyone liked Led Zeppelin at my little school. And my dad was like, okay cool and showed me funkadelic mm -hmm. and i remember being like, pow, pow, pow. <laughs> like yeah. i was like what who is this yes. and then my dad was like yeah maybe it's time for you to get some records get your hands on the <laughs> stuff and so me and my dad just like really bonded on funk music and specifically george clinton mm -hmm. and like junie morrison and that entire world of music and it really like that was my foundation of like secular music was like these black rock stars from the 60s and 70s and then like as time went my parents loosened and i you know got to mess around with more music but my dad's record collection was kind of home base yeah mm -hmm. but you've been like how dare you keep this music away yes. from me for so long it was all <laughs> fucked up because my parents didn't drink yeah nothing you know no drinking no smoking no cussing no secular music until it was like 15 16 my dad was just like <laughs> like <laughs> Ah, like rocking, you know, and yeah. uh, me and my dad are pretty close. What an introduction yeah. to music as well. I think as somebody that's black and kind of occupies a perceived, well, occupies alternative music space, which is perceived as being super white, to have um, the experience of, like you say, your first experience with secular music being black rock stars, mm -hmm. kind of, um, in some ways, it's the inverse experience of what some black kids um uh, get from it and also a lot of white people they assume mm. that rock music kind of belongs to them um, so it's kind of amazing that you kind of you experienced sort of rock music in that way for the f that was your first experience of it yeah and you know everyone comes to music in their own way I feel really grateful that my parents were huge parliament fans mm -hmm. and huge Teddy Pendergrass fans and you know big Donna Summer fan big you know Brides of Funkenstein fans you know mm -hmm. that's what my parents loved when they were growing up and you know over time they threw that at us um but i do you know remember many times like you know i grew up where there was a lot of country music and i was like this sounds a lot like blues yeah, <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, this sounds yeah. a lot. i was like all this stuff was happening at the same time and you know it's, i think it's important that people realize that it's like all of it is happening at the yeah. same time. Yeah. And I think that the way that people listen to music of our generation now is that it seems almost abnormal to only have like one single taste in music. Mm -hmm. um, can you imagine like being the kind of person that says they only listen to mid noughties British indie, for example? I don't know. It's always been hard for me to like just one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and like with my records, it's it's a lot of stuff. It's a yeah. little bit of everything. So no, I couldn't imagine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just like um, one thing. It would get kind of boring. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do remember like I think probably when I was growing up, there was a period of time where I only listened to maybe I shouldn't admit this, but I only listened to like Razor Light and Libertines. Powerful. And, yeah. Yo, very powerful at that there time. There was a moment in my life where the only thing I would listen to was a Disney Channel band. <laughs> Cleopatra is amazing. I know, if they see this. Y'all are great. Y'all are great. <laughs> I would love another record from Cleopatra. Absolutely. Cleopatra coming at you. Yeah, I mean, stuck in my brain forever. <laughs> yeah. And the braids. Yes. Oh! <laughs> I want to talk first about the National Covers EP. Um, 
I mean, I'm assuming that you're a huge fan of the National Festival, but um, what made you want to kind of reinterpret their music? Was it just something that you, sh you thought you saw as a creative outlet? Were you um, nervous to like start putting your own music out? What was it? Uh, so many reasons. I love that band. Mm. It's like my favorite band ever, like ever, maybe, mm. probably. And it's like half about the music and half about how they live their lives and how their career is gone. Because, you know, it's one thing to fall in love with their music, which is fantastic. But I loved their work ethic. And like, I feel like when you want to be a musician or a creative or a writer or a painter, everyone is always telling you all the bad things about it. They're like, you're not going to make any money. You're not going to be able to get married. You're not going to have a family. You're not going to be able to buy a house. Like all of these downsides, you know, people are so quick to assume that the success is just impossible and mm -hmm. it's just, you're going to spin your wheels forever. But when I saw, see the national, I see like these guys kind of have everything. Like they have friendships. Like a lot of them have great relationships. They're yeah. married. They've got a wonderful career that spans many, many, many great records. Like I was like, they're, they kind of disprove all that mm -hmm. in a way to me. And the fact that they did it when they were like in their mid late thirties, I was, you know, work, I worked normal jobs like everybody else up until a year ago, mm -hmm. you know, I'm 33. And I always was like, this band kind of shows me like if you you trust it and you you f go with your gut long enough, like you'll build it one fan at a time and you can plan for that. You know, not planning on like a big hit. You're just like, I'm going to yeah. just go with my gut on this, you mm -hmm. know, and that was inspiring to me. And then just like in the larger context of being like a black artist, mm -hmm. like you were saying, like they also represent a world of music. In some ways, it hasn't been all the way friendly to black artists. Mm -hmm. It hasn't like accepted the contribution that black artists have made to the genre broadly. So I was like, I'd love to reinterpret reinterpret my favorite band that also is like a product of this system that I think could be fixed. And I want to do it my way, my black southern country yeah. way. Yeah. Um, and so that's like what I did. And um, that's, those are like some of my favorite arrangements. I've ever done mm -hmm. and I it was really cool to work with them on the release of it their label put it out like yeah. I'm I'm on the same label with them now yeah, yeah. I'm going on tour with them in a few weeks yeah it's, it's kind of amazing yeah you know? mind so, blowing yeah it's amazing <laughs> um so yeah the national the best um, I liked what you said about um the idea that they've had a really prolonged but sort of um not slow, but just a really considered career um I guess we live in a kind of time where like you say you know a people kind of dine out on like a huge pop hit and they don't necessarily see the the greatness in just trying to graft it out and mm -hmm. trying to get better or sustain your your art um and I think that's a really really good point I mean how do you think about what you want your career to look like is it the same kind of thing you want to have a considered approach to how you release music yeah and for a number of reasons you know like I always want to feel like the things I'm making are the things I really want to make. I don't want to chase hits or feel like I need to make a big song this year or I'm screwed. You mm -hmm. know, I want it always to be like the people that come to see me play are people who love what I make, period. And um, I'm willing to build that over time. Yeah. It'd be great if I had a major crazy song, you know. A big sync. Yeah, why not? You know, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. You know, but only because it would give me more gas to sustain this journey that I'm on. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. Um, I know we were just talking about how, like, we're big TV fans. And have you watched Abbott Elementary? Yes. Yeah, right? I Quinta. love it. I love it so much. But um, she was talking about how she hates the um, idea of people calling things overnight successes. Yeah. Um, because it's quite, like, it assumes that people haven't really sort of worked hard behind the scenes to get to that point. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a re that like it kind of echoes what you're saying because it's a, it's not necessarily just about wanting a big hit, but if everything else is kind of in motion already, like you have like an amazing fan base that love your music, but in process of that you wind up having a big hit, then mm -hmm. it kind of feels like you've 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 deserved it and also you've worked hard enough for it that you kind of deserve that big hit as well. Yeah, I agree with that. And you know, even for people that have big hits early in their careers, it's, you know, there's so many moving pieces, you know, there's a lot that goes into everything you see, you yeah. know, it's nothing is what it looks like. Yeah. Let's talk a little about Live Forever. Um, I guess that was people's first experience of your original music. Um, what did you want, what story did you want to tell around that record? Like what, as your first or your 
your first major outing into presenting your own music, what mm -hmm. was the what was the drive? Well, I kind of just wanted people to see me. I, I felt like I had been playing music for so long, and I had hit a point where it wasn't make or break, but I had a clear vision finally of like what I wanted to make. Like I was like guitar player for a minute. I played for Melanie Charles and Lizzie No, and played in a bunch of hardcore bands and jazz bands, and was touring and working my full time job and. I was having a good time, honestly. Um, but I hit a point where I was like, there's a whole world of music I want to make, but I don't think I can do it with any of these other people. I think I got to do it myself. And once I made it and saw it, I was like, oh, this is what I've been trying to make the whole time. Mm -hmm. And it just unwrapped a whole world of music and ideas and ways that I wanted to explain who I was um, as a means for connecting to people that are like me, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and so that record was is a special record to yeah. me. Mm -hmm. um, I really enjoy uh, Free Kelly Rowland um, with mm -hmm. Armand Hammer, um, mainly because I do believe that Kelly Rowland is a very underappreciated musician and she has many, many good solo records. Many. Um, not just singles, solo records. records. And she invented two genres, um, uh, <laughs> country music with Train on the Track, mm. And Oont's Oont music with all of those amazing... Yeah. Yeah, think about it. Also, there's the Nelly and Kelly. And Nelly and Kelly. And that's a country song. And that is a country that's song. That's a country song. So she deserves her credit for inventing that, those two oh, genres. That is the OG Old Town Road. Yes. I remember when I heard that song, I was like, this is like, this is a Toby Keith, like, Shania, like, yeah. duo. Mm -hmm. Before Juros existed. Yes. She's... People, people, people sleep on that people shit. People really though. do. People sleep on that shit. Go back. Go back and listen to that song. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and how did you hook up with Owen Hammer as well? Yo, I can't tell you the real story. Okay. <laughs> will it, will it, what, what will happen? What's going to happen? People going oh, to jail? <laughs> no, there's just baby moms involved. And there's people that, you know, that don't want to be known. We have a mutual friend who reached out to me and was like, I love your music. And I think that the people in Arm and Hammer do too. And I was like, I would love to meet them. And they were like, probably won't get to meet them, but let me know if you want to work with them. And mm -hmm. so I released Kelly Rowland in its original state, but through some just like bullshit, I, it couldn't live. And so I had to remake the song and I reached out to them first and they were like super down to do it. And I love them both so much. I think yeah. they're like, like such thoughtful and important artists. Yeah. And, Kind of like in the way that the National are, like this mm -hmm. like long sustained thing over so many years and everyone loves them. Every person in their community, it, it's beautiful what they've built. Yeah. And so I was happy to have them on the song. Yeah, they're incredible. Mm -hmm. um, again, kind of like when you first hear them, like Galaxy Brain, like amazing stuff. Yeah, you're like, dog, you're in a different place, dog. Yeah. Like Billy Woods, like, you, like that, that fool's in a different world. Mm -hmm. Lucid, different world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then moving on to Farm to Table, um, you mentioned about, you know, hearing that lots of people wanted to work with you and having to go to LA for that. Um, and I like I, I enjoyed what you said about LA being quite a sort of tricky place to navigate, to put it nicely. Mm -hmm. um, could you expand a little bit about your experience in LA? Yeah, I mean, there's layers to LA, obviously. I mean, I I, I like LA. LA's a great city. Mm -hmm. And I have some really good friends that live there and some great songwriters that live there that I really fuck with. But at that stage in my life, everyone that I was working with, minus a few people, we're just trying to figure out how I was making my songs. I felt like it was more of an extractive process. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like they were adding much to me. It was more like we'd get in a studio and we'd start working and they would just be looking over my shoulder. And I was like, I can run the session. You know, mm -hmm. like I don't really need anyone to run the session, you know? Um, so it was, it was an interesting experience. I learned a lot, really mostly learned to trust my gut on stuff and not, just because someone has a Grammy or yeah. has done some things or is a little older doesn't mean they can do what I do necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, and I had, you know, a huge part of my journey as a recording artist was playing in bands and going to studios and people just disrespecting me fully and not trusting what I thought or what I wanted to do or the things that I was hearing. And I didn't know how to do it myself at the time. And so from like 22 to now, like I just was teaching myself how to engineer and produce and Live Forever was like the first record I produced, mm -hmm. you know, and people were like, 
just wanted to know how I did stuff. And yeah. I was like, nah, I'm going to go home and finish this record. <laughs> I'm going to take this. I'm just going to finish this one. Yeah. I did meet some good people, though, that I'm definitely going to keep working with. Yeah. There's a guy, Dave Sermonera, that I was working with that I think was really special. Um, even Lawrence Rothman, really special. They worked on the uh, Eve Tumor record, oh, which amazing. is like amazing. probably my favorite record of the last five years. Mm. So, yeah, some good people, but yeah. not everybody. And then when you heard that 4AD wanted to work with you, how did that feel? <laughs> From the first email... I've already started talking myself out of it. I Why? was like, it's not going to work out. It's okay. It's okay that it's not going to work okay, out. Okay, got you. You know, like, they know who you are. Maybe in the future when you're, like, better at this, they'll give you a deal that you want. But from jump, they were just, like, so proactive. And, like, I was so fucking sh taken back by that. Some of my favorite bands yeah. ever, you know, like TV on the radio and mm -hmm. Justin Vernon and National Cocktail. I mean, you know, just goes on and on and on. St. Vincent, you know, yeah. I was just like, I was honored to be even thought of, of someone that could exist in that class of musicians. Cause I mm -hmm. always saw 4AD as like a label that just like had great taste. And yeah, absolutely. You know, um, really good sort of past and current, like you can tell that there's a genuine love for music. Yeah. Um, and they um, kind of lock in with artists. Like, they really, they pick an artist and they're like, cool, like, we're doing it. We're yeah. building it now. And, you know, talk to a lot of great labels, but 4 mm -hmm. was, since I was a kid, I always wanted to do it. That was it. the one. Mm -hmm. Farm to table, what's the influence behind that except for yeah. food? Well, I mean, like, I grew up in a rural area. I used to paint fences on a farm, mm -hmm. on Bob Funk's farm. He had, like, these three big, like, brass pigs when you pull up to his house, I remember the first time I pulled up to his house, he was like, each one of those is $500,000. <laughs> wow. I was like, that's a lot <laughs> for statues. But anyways, he's run a big hog farm, big cow farm in the in Oklahoma. And I used to paint fences over there. Um, but yeah, I was just kind of reflecting on my life. And I was like, I usually like live in a place where people don't get to do this kind of thing. And now I'm at the table with like Phoebe Bridgers and mm -hmm. the National and all these people that I've watched and listened to for so many years from my office desk and just being like, geez, like, how do you like become someone like that or meet these people or, you know, write like they do. And yeah. now I'm like, I, you know, talk to Lucy Dacus a couple times a month, you know, yeah, so, yeah, so it's yeah. just like kind of reflecting on my life at this period in time before mm -hmm. I go deeper. Are you still kind of like, what am I doing here um, when you meet these people? No, nah, I mean, if I were younger, I probably would feel that way. Mm -hmm. I remember feeling like that in my jobs. I was always the only black person there. Mm -hmm. And I'm oftentimes still, you know, kind of one of the only black people in a room. Mm -hmm. But I've been doing this for so long. Like, I've played so many shows. I feel like I've proved it to myself. Yeah. Like, I know what I'm doing and I deserve to be here. And it's great that people are recognizing that. But beyond all of that, I just I'm proud of myself that yeah. I just like. I'm proud that, like, when I go on stage, like, I feel like it's mine. Yeah. You know, it doesn't, I don't feel like I'm stepping into another room. The other rooms are mine. It's and nice. I, I feel as well, like, the current um, sort of state of alternative music does feel quite welcoming. Mm -hmm. um, if you do think of artists like Phoebe, um, if you think of Lucy Dacus, if you yeah. think of Mitski, I guess Japanese Breakfast, there's, all, there's, there's a sense of... A real sense of community, I think. Mm -hmm. um, would you agree with that in your yeah, personal experience? Yeah, definitely. Definitely among them. They, there's some real, real vibes. <laughs> and I mean, I'm grateful for them. This will be my, I'm playing with um, Phoebe Bridgers at the Brixton Academy yeah. in a couple of days. And I, I mean, I opened for her last year, you know, so it's, I feel like the circle, you know, it, it's nice. I'm, I feel really grateful to be welcomed into that world. And do you have a specific song on Farm to Table that you're particularly proud of, whether it's um, in terms of its lyrical themes or whether it's in terms of how long it took you to make it or... Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty... I love that album. Yeah, as you should. <laughs> and each of the songs have different... I'm proud of in different ways, but Cosigns was the hardest to write mm -hmm. because I had to fully like accept what was happening and I had to like say it and mm -hmm. mean it. And that was the only way the song would work. The song is so like at a 10 that you can't you can't walk into the song if you're not meeting it at that level of intensity and like mm -hmm. vibe so that was the hardest one to write and i'd been sitting on that beat for like a couple years and i didn't know how to really finish it and 
Um, I was like right after that Lucy Dacus tour, I was about to start my Courtney Dacus, or my Courtney Barnett tour. Mm. And um, I was just like, this is crazy. Like I'm in the 4AD studio, like making my first record with them. And all these people are so supportive and I'm gonna like fully lean into that, yeah. you know, feeling, so. You mentioned about how when you were growing up, you thought that your life was going to be anything but travel, like you just didn't want the kind of military rat lifestyle. You wanted to be settled in one place. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously that that's not how it happened. Not at this point. No, yeah. no. Um, <laughs> do you think that um, that was kind of a subconscious thing or it's just how it's just how it came to be? Yeah, I think it's just a subconscious thing. Like I I just remember like every time we'd move somewhere, everyone had friends for like five mm -hmm. years. Yeah. And I'd have to like hurry up and like figure out what everyone liked, what everyone's listening to quickly like adapt assimilate fit in where i could yeah and i was like i'd love for when i have kids for them to have like long-term friends like yeah. i'd love to have a long-term friend <laughs> yeah you know that'd be nice now that i'm older like i kind of understand my parents a lot more like my dad loved what he did mm -hmm. my mom loved what she does and i love what i do you know this is like an amazing gift to get to just run around the world yeah and play music with your friends mm -hmm. Who knows? It's a nice chapter, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. um, I moved around a lot when I was younger and I was always like obsessed with the idea of, you know, when you watch TV and like it's a family growing up in one house and the parents like put no notches of when, how tall they get. <laughs> And then they're like, to like they get to I, 18 and there's a notch or something. Yes. I was always so obsessed with wanting that. I know. Same. <laughs> same. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's so funny. Seeing that, I would that. get jealous. Yeah. I would, I would be like, what? Oh, yeah. I feel that. Do you think though that because you moved around a lot that it made you, it gave you the ability to communicate better with different kinds of people? Um, 100%. Yeah. I feel like I have like a, like my bachelor's, master's and PhD is in white people. Mm -hmm. I know white people. Yeah. I've grown up with the whitest of white people. Yeah. Um, Oklahoma, right in the, like the middle of the Bible belt of America. Like that was my education of like how to move through the world. It was actually in a way kind of fucked me up. Because when I moved to Brooklyn and D.C. and lived with black people, I had to, like, come all the way back, you know, because mm -hmm. um, I realized that it kind of took something from me, like always having to fit, always having to bend to fit into someone else's little world when yeah. I lived with, you know, white people or when I worked at all white nonprofits, mm -hmm. you know, for 10 years yeah. or in the government or whatever. Um, once I kind of left that and was working with artists who are mostly black live in like black creative communities i kind of was able to be myself in a way that i didn't even know existed yeah you know like mm -hmm. you know so very grateful to those people taja cheek from lorraine was one of those people mm -hmm. who kind of let me into her world and i lived right down the street from her and I, that changed my life yeah so you mentioned that you started writing the next record or have you been just in a constant always always yeah. writing mm -hmm. how far are you down that process what could you tell us or 4D won't let you? Mm -hmm. It's fucking sick. It's the craziest shit I've ever made. Mm -hmm. Did you say mm. that you sam you sampled <laughs> you sampled a song from the next record on this record? Yeah. Like the prequel to the sequel. Yeah, there's stuff yeah, it's a when it comes when you when you hear the next one you'll be like, Oh, okay. <laughs> He's in the future. <laughs> no, but I'm really proud of it. And I am still writing and I feel like I'm finding more things to talk about and tour has been interesting yeah right like i understand now like bands start touring and the records get weirder mm -hmm. like i'm like damn like writing from perspectives i haven't in really felt and i'm also just getting older and i want different things yeah so yeah i'm excited for the next one you is know. this your sun Ra moment is this real oh. <laughs> octavia oh. butler moment oh. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. This is another Barty Strange moment. It'll just be different, you know? Like, it's just different. It'll be different than the last ones. And uh, the next ones after that will be different than the last ones. It's just, just a reflection of myself and my little journey through life. It's, it's very just, important. Uh, yeah. Um, and do you have any favorite records from this year? I... Yo, yes. Yeah. Um, Donna Massal put mm -hmm. out an EP. Um, I forgot what it was called. I'm... I'm blanking on it but she has a song on it called insecure which has been like a mantra of mine all year i think it's incredible and it was so funny like she she got signed to this big label and put that ep out and i think they dropped her and 
I saw her post that she was having a tough time with it. And I sent her a message where I was just like, you are so fucking good at this. Like, mm -hmm. please keep going. Like, cause it really was, a, it really touched me how beautiful that EP is. And I think she like made it in her room over the course of the pandemic with a producer named Sega Bodega, who I think is based in the UK. Mm -hmm. It's just fantastic. Yeah, he's amazing. Like, oh, I just love it. Mm -hmm. I've been listening to it a lot. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for talking with me. Yeah, this for sure. This was really fun. Yeah, thanks for having me. No problem.